Okay, let's get started. Uh, so I'm going to grade the exam later this afternoon, so I don't know what uh, how, how the scores are, but hopefully it'll be back on Monday and I'll post the grades on Blackboard, uh, which is great. Um, so it's a physics question Friday today, and someone asked, uh, previous classes we focused on the properties of solid and gases, but never on more extreme ones. What are some uncompensates of matter? Where do they appear? Do they have useful properties? Um, also, why do different states of matter follow such different laws? So this is actually quite an interesting question. Do different states of matter follow different laws? Um, it's actually one of the, the most beautiful things in physics, as far as I'm concerned, is basically the idea of universality, that there are certain symmetries of nature, and if those symmetries are obeyed, then no matter how different systems might look microscopically, they actually behave in the same way at microscopic <coughs> scale, or scales that we can measure or probe. Um, and so there's a, a, a theory called the, the lando ginsburg theory of phase transitions. I mean, it basically says that you have the same symmetries and the same number of components of your order parameter, the same dimension of space, that things that are drastically different behave the same. And so the classic example for this is that, for example, the uh, liquid gas transition can actually be mapped onto a magnetic transition in a chunk of matter. So they basically look the same um, at, at length scales in the lab, basically. Uh, so the, so the, the point is that actually different states of matter can follow very similar laws and then we understand how those work very well. So just a, an example of a bunch of exotic states of matter. Uh, so this right here is a, a container filled with superfluid. So I'm going to talk about this more today. The superfluid will, can actually climb the walls even in the presence of gravity and this container will drain right out. So superfluid is a, is a liquid without viscosity. Uh, this is a, a, a topological insulator. Right here, a two-dimensional topological insulator where the edge states of this material, even though the bulk is insulating, so inside the bulk, no charges can move, right? But because of quantum mechanics and some interesting properties, basically on the edge or on the surface, we can have a metal. So this is a, a very, it's the same chunk of matter, but the, the bulk and the edge behave very differently. This is a ferrofluid, so it's basically a, a liquid that has ferromagnetic particles inside of it. And it's hard to see in this picture, but you can subject to a, to a magnetic field and weird stuff happens. Uh, plasmas, we're going to talk about plasmas today. This is actually a picture of a plasma torch that's over in engineering, uh, just across from us, where they do lots of cool research on aircraft re-entry, spacecraft re-entry. Uh, superconductors, we already talked about this. This is not a picture from Avatar, but a picture from an actual experiment on a chunk of a superconductor. Both Einstein condensates. This is a, a picture where you can see atomic scale resolution. These dots are atoms of, uh, I think it's lanthanum barium copper oxide, a high temperature superconductor that we have on Earth that superconducts around 150 Kelvin or so. And this is uh, also in the, the case where the doping, where the number of, of holes in the system is small, this thing behaves like an antiferromagnet, so it's very different than this ferromagnetic case. Um, and that, this is probably the, one of the more exotic ones on here, um, the quantum Hall effect, where electrons actually appear to behave as if they're split into three. So this, you know, we could have a whole class on all of these, and, and there are classes uh, in our year on solid state physics and things. Uh, today I'm going to talk about plasmas, and I'm going to talk about superfluids. Uh, and of course, as is usually the case, people will be very brief, and if you have more questions, come talk to me. All right, so if we want to say what's unconventional, we need to know what's conventional. Um, so these are kind of the conventional phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And so the thing to note is basically as we go in this direction, from let's say gas down to solid, the thing that's changing, at least at the atomic scale, is this system is becoming more ordered. And, and moreover, I mentioned this thing about symmetries before. So the gas, in some sense, is totally symmetric. There's no special place inside the container of a gas, right? So up here is the same as down here, as, uh, at least in terms of how the particles are, are concerned. So then we cool down. We move to a more ordered state where now there's a broken symmetry in the sense that up here is down different than down here, right? So we've broken some spatial symmetry, they, due to the effects of gravity, this thing has basically come down here. In the absence of gravity, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these two. And if we cool the system down or put it in even more pressure, well, not only do we break the spatial symmetry of the, of the beaker, we also break translational symmetry because now there's special places where the atoms want to sit, right? So not every place is the same inside the beaker. And so you should think about phase transitions or different states of matter as being related to breaking symmetries. Right here, the atoms can be anywhere. Here, they have to be in very specific places. So we've broken translational symmetry. So these can basically put on a phase diagram that looks like the following. So we have pressure on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal axis. And so this is just these three. So we can basically, let's say, as we cool down, we go from gas 
do a liquid into a solid, <coughs> get directly from a gas to a solid, there's a triple point we can go around. So this is really why gases and liquids are not distinct, because at very high temperatures or high pressures, we can actually go around this line essentially and move right from a gas to a liquid. Of course, we can freeze, we can move ever in this, this diagram. So this is a very conventional picture of the, the, the phase of matter. And notice the most important point, at least in for my discussion of the superfluids, is going to be this triple point right here. Okay, so, so superfluids and, and Bose Einstein condensate, so this is a, a, a more exotic state of matter. This is basically when I, quantum mechanics comes into play very strongly here, and I'll talk about how that works. So basically, the superfluid state of, of helium 4 was first discovered in 1937, um, and, and Peter Kapitza got a, a Nobel Prize in 1978 for it. So this is basically bosons. Bosons are, are particles that have integer spin. And they, they have Bose symmetry, which means they can basically all be in the same place at the same time. So two electrons cannot be in the same place at the same time. That's, that's the nature of a fermion. Bosons can. So basically, these bosons can Bose condense into this exotic state that has essentially a complete wave description. So people have probably heard of this wave particle duality of nature. So in these bosonic systems at very low temperature, they basically all behave like waves. And we'll learn why that is in a second. So first, superfluid, so this is a high density fluid. Um, it goes superfluid at about two Kelvin, so that's pretty close to absolute zero, but still reasonably hot. Compared to Bose-Einstein condensate, which were first discovered in cold gases in 1995. And so we say cold, this is really, really cold, right? This is 400 nano Kelvin, 200 nano Kelvin. This is 10 to the minus nine Kelvin, incredibly close to absolute zero. So you need to really, really cool things down to get this state of matter. So this picture is showing that as we cool down, there's, this is the velocity distribution, it's the average velocity of particles as we cool down, there's a huge peak right at zero. So this means that when we measure the velocity of individual particles, at some point they're basically not moving at all. That's because we can no longer distinguish individual particles, they're just all collapsed into the zero momentum state, the k equals zero state, if you like. And so this is 3795, what's going to happen in 2020? So there's some proposals that you could use these types of Bose Einstein condensates to actually build a computing machine talked about quantum computing previously. Um, so 1995, uh, Nobel Prize for, for getting this PC by Wolfgang Ketterle and Carl Weinman and Eric Cornell. And Carl Weinman, I think, was uh, President Obama, had him running some educational proposals or some educational programs in the U.S. for a while. So definitely a guy that you want to be running um, education in the U.S. that has a, a pretty sweet Nobel Prize. Okay, so, so why is helium so, so different? Well, if you look at the phase diagrams, the same thing, the pressure, temperature, phase diagram of helium, the first thing you should note is there's no triple point, right? There's no point where the gas, liquid, and solid coexist. So if I cool down at constant pressure, basically I never get into a solid phase. So let's just flip back up here. So here, basically, if I cool down at constant pressure for a conventional material, I'll always get into this solid, no matter what the pressure is. But the, the cool thing about the helium phase diagram is so I have my gas up here. So this is really low temperature. This is about 2 degrees Kelvin, so minus 271 degrees Celsius or something. So I cool down at, at, uh, at constant pressure. And instead of going into the solid, which I still can get to at very high pressure, I have a phase transition to a very exotic state that we call the superfluid. superfluid state. So why do we call it the superfluid? Well, it's basically, so it, it's quantum. It'll flow with, without viscosity. So it's a viscousless fluid. So for example, if I have a, a sand bucket and I put water, I pour a glass of water on top of that sand bucket, if I wait long enough, it's going to soak into the sand, right? But it, it'll take a long time. And if I have the sand really, really tightly packed together, I can actually have water floating on top of it. If I pour superfluid helium on top, it'll just immediately go right through, right? So it basically can find the tiny little channels and, and move through it without viscosity. We know that if you want to, you know, if let's say you're drinking uh, Coke or a milkshake, you have to suck harder on the milkshake to get it up through a straw, right? So in this case, you basically don't need to suck at all, and helium will flow through any straw, no matter how small it is. It has no viscosity at all. Um, it carries no entropy, so it means basically it can't carry heat. Um, and probably the most exciting thing is that if you try to, if you have a container and I try to rotate a container filled with superfluid helium, it won't rotate at all. So if I have a bucket filled with superfluid helium and I rotate the, the handle of the bucket, the superfluid will just stay there. It will not move. It's basically insensitive to, to rotations. And that's basically related to the fact that it can only rotate in, in uh, certain quanta related to the, the mass of helium atoms. This is a direct, uh, direct property of quantum mechanics. OK, so let's see if we can try to understand why helium is so special. So helium-4, this is the bosonic 
version. There's also helium-3, which is fermionic. Uh, helium-4 basically has no spin. It's very abundant. Um, it's incredibly symmetric, right? It almost looks like a perfect sphere. It's bosonic, as I said, it's very stable. So we're up here. Uh, one of the noble gases. So what we can do is we can ask, so we have this wave-particle duality of nature, and we can ask for helium, what do its wave properties look like? So how do we determine what its wave properties look like? Well, momentum is related to the wavelength through this relation here. So the momentum, there's some constant called Planck, Planck's constant, it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. And we know that the kinetic energy is just p squared over 2n. So basically combining these two things, we can write down the wavelength in terms of the energy. And then at the given temperature, we know that the energy goes like kVt. And so we can get a relationship between what's known as the thermal de Broglie wavelength. At a given temperature, how wave-like is a chunk of matter, right? I'm not very wave-like. Um, a, a helium atom is pretty wave-like. It goes inversely with the mass. So the lighter something is, the more likely it is to have wave-like properties, and also related to temperature, right? The smaller the temperature, the more wave-like something is. And the reason why we are not very wave-like is this H, H bar Planck's constant is really small. It's like 10 to the minus 31, 34. It's very, very small, and so things are not very wave-like. Wave -like. The wavelength is very small. Okay, so, so helium should be wave-like, but because of its symmetry, it's also very weakly interacting. So people have probably seen this Leonard Jones potential before, right? This is if I have a squishy electron cloud, I have an induced dipole-dipole interaction, it goes like one over r to the sixth, that's this term right here. So if I look at the, this Leonard Jones potential for helium, it's this green curve here, and if I look at it for neon, so the first thing I notice is that neon, another noble gas, is much more strongly interacting, so helium is very weakly interacting. Um, and I can look at this thermal de Broglie wavelength and ask how big is it at some temperature. And so what I find is that at around 2 Kelvin, the thermal de Broglie wavelength of helium is actually exactly equal to the minimum of its interaction potential. So as a fluke of nature, helium atoms want to sit a certain distance apart. It's exactly this, around three angstroms. But at that distance, they're basically, that's exactly the wavelength of their wave properties. And so all the particles no longer basically, so they, they have to sit at some distance, and that's the exact distance they need to be apart from each other to exactly experience their wave properties, basically. And so they can form these coherent matter waves, they both condense, and they have these very special properties. So similar to when I was explaining superconductivity, quantum mechanics lets them all move together in unison. Similarly here for the helium atoms, they can all move together in unison. How do we get friction or viscosity in a fluid? It's because it's the particles are interacting with each other, they're, they're, they're running into the walls of the container. Here, everything moves lockstep together, and we get a viscous fluid. If I look at neon, so this is the, the thermal de Broglie wave like for neon, it's really, really small, whereas the interaction distance, the distance that the atoms want to be apart from each other in a liquid phase is much, much larger. Right? So helium is really the only element in nature that has this very special property where there's a, a relationship between the wavelength of its wave properties and how far apart the atoms want to, want to sit. And so this is a, another picture. So basically, if I fill up a beaker with helium, it'll climb the walls and just spontaneously empty because there's no viscosity. So I can take advantage of the fact that there's some interaction potential between helium and the walls. right? So usually, I, the, the reason why I don't climb up the walls of the, of, the, of the container is basically because there's some capillary force keeping me down. Here, this is just going to climb up and empty. And so that's what you're seeing right here. All right, so that was the first one. I, I did helium in 10 minutes or, or more, so we'll see how long it takes me to do plasmas. So plasmas may be a little bit less exotic than superfluids, but still very, very interesting. So plasmas, basically sometimes people call these the, the fourth state of matter, so solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Um, I would say they're, they're a little bit easier to understand than superfluids because you don't need quantum mechanics. So this is a plot of temperature versus number density. And so the, the point to, to note here is these numbers are all really high. So plasmas are after gases. If, it, if I take a gas and heat it up to be really, really hot, put it at very, very high pressures, basically what I can get is that the, the electrons disassociate from the atoms. And so basically I have a neutral gas of charged particles. And the fact that it's charged is what gives plasmas their, their very, uh, sorry, the, the, the individual Components are charged, what gives plasmas uh, their very special properties. Uh, so it's basically the most abundant form of ordinary matter in the universe. 
So if you take that little slice of our pie chart, where it was at 4.6% regular matter in the universe, the largest component of that is thought to be plasmas that are interstellar plasmas that are surrounding space. Um, and understanding plasmas actually has lots of really cool applications. I already mentioned space travel. Uh, there's lots of research being done here at UVM. When I have a, a spacecraft that's entering an atmosphere, there's so much friction at the surface that it basically creates an ionized plasma at the surface, and so a lot of the degradation effects happen right there, so trying to understand that. Um, fusion energy, so if we want to use, make energy like the sun makes energy, we need to understand how plasmas work. All right, so schematically, this is basically the idea. So a gas is made up of constituent atoms or molecules, each of the components of the gas is neutral. Whereas for a plasma, because I've heated it up so much, I've actually stripped the electrons right off. And so if this is a, a, a highly conductive um, gas, if you like. Um, and basically, as we'll, we'll learn more later on in the course, when I have moving charges, I create magnetic fields. And so as these electrons move through this plasma, I have very strong magnetic fields. Um, and so I can, I can ask what's the degree of ionization of the plasma. This is just the ratio of the number of ionized atoms divided by the total number of atoms. So I can have plasmas that aren't fully ionized. In other words, there can still be some molecules um, or atoms that aren't ionized kicking around. All right, so people have probably seen these before, plasma globes, right? So uh, Hannes Albion, I think that's how you pronounce his name, got a Nobel Prize in 1970 for fundamental discoveries in magnetohydrodynamics. This is basically how, how hydrodynamics works in plasmas. And as an interesting side note, he actually shared this Nobel Prize in 1970 with Louis Niel, who was this discoverer of the Niel state, which is completely unrelated to plasmas. That year, they basically just said, well, there's two guys, they've both done amazing things, completely unrelated, let's both give them half a Nobel Prize. Um, and, and I can certainly talk about the Niel state of, uh, of matter at, at another time, it's related to magnetism. So if there's one set of things to think about plasmas, it's basically in this chart. So if I, if I ask what's their electrical conductivity, a gas is basically insulating. Right, if I have air, it's not going to create with electricity. Whereas plasmas, because of these free charges, it's very easy for them to move, uh, to, to conduct. So they're highly conducting. In a gas, there's basically one type of species, maybe a few single atoms. In plasmas, I have electrons, ions, protons, neutrons. The velocities in, in, uh, in plasmas are Maxwellian. They're exponentially distributed around 0, u to the minus v squared. Right? That's because basically everything is dominated by just one atom colliding into another atom. But in plasmas, that's not really the case. The interactions are, are much more collective, and I can have very flat velocity distributions, which means I can have very slow ions and very, very fast electrons all in the same gas. So that the velocities are basically all velocities are almost equally likely. Uh, and I already mentioned interactions. So in, in the gas, Basically, I have one atom comes in, collides with another one, I have conservation of momentum, they go off in some other direction. In plasmas, because of all the electric and magnetic fields and all the strong interactions, I get collective waves, plasma oscillations. All right, so this is my last slide. We see these plasmas all over the place. This is a pretty cool video. Of, I think this is the Australia uh, Borealis, or Orealis from, uh, from the, the International Space Station. So this is a, an example of plasmas, right? We have, uh, basically highly charged particles at, at the poles. Um, the quark gluon plasma, so inside, so quarks or hadrons are made up of, of quarks. The gauge boson, the, the particle that, that exerts the strong force, that mediates the, the strong force is called the gluon. And so if you heat up quark matter, it's basically people think that in the early universe, before things coalesced into, into baryonic matter, we just had a plasma of quarks and gluons. This is a, a fusion reactor that's being built on Earth, trying to figure out how we can use fusion to, to have power. People have probably seen these Tesla co coils before, uh, lightning, and these are, this is basically ion jets at, at the poles of the Earth. So these are basically all around us. As I said, even at UVM, across the way, we have a high energy plasma torch that's doing research into, into aeronautics. Uh, and that, that's, that's all I have to say about plasmas right now. Any questions about either plasmas or superfluids? Too much information, too fast. Yeah? Um, so, what is wave-like as opposed to... Particle-like. Particle-like. Yeah, so basically, when you think of particle-like, you should really think of basically one particle comes up and interacts, uh, you know, scatters off another one, and they both in, they move in some direction. And waves, we think more of interference. So waves interfere with each other and produce some interference pattern. And so essentially, the, the, the way that 
Um, the, the way that interactions happen is related to their, their properties, wavelength or part or, or, or part of the light. But they all have properties of both at the same time. Um, the, the fundamental thing to remember for superfluids is because these particles are bosons, they can all be in the same place at the same time, um, quantum mechanically speaking, and so they can all condense into their ground state, which all has the same set of quantum numbers, and so that means that I can't distinguish one from another. Um, so there's no longer individual particles, at least in, in this low energy description, instead they can only be described by their momentum and not their positions anymore. Other questions? Nope? Okay, so let's switch back to some examples and uh, electric potential. 